Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. As you see, they, they stole my podium. I, I have to sit. <laughs> and I will try. Now, apparently, the, uh, the Picasso shows uh, create so many mini events that they need this, this thing badly, and so they give me a nice little table. Uh, it's the last lecture, so it's more relaxed. I guess I will sit instead of trying to convince you of a difficult subject. And uh, so maybe it goes with the, uh, the atmosphere of today. Okay, so uh, last subject, uh, I, I entitled it, I don't know if you saw it, uh, in the kind of publicity that we made, The Inscapes of Bordua. Uh, meaning the, it's a word, of course, create with landscape, but instead of being landscape, it's the landscape of the interior, uh, if you want. And, I want to link what we said at the end of the last lecture with what we will do today uh, by making this reflection. I said we cannot reflect on landscape uh, painting as we have done in this series of lectures, uh, of six lectures, uh, without asking ourselves uh, some fundamental uh, question about the concept of place. Uh, and as we said at the end of our last lecture, to express uh, a kind of attachment to place, to a place, uh, uh, it's also to introduce in humanity this division between what is octoton, uh, what is uh, of us, if you want, and what is foreigner, what is for the foreigner, what is for the other. Uh, and it, I think you cannot avoid it. Any painting will stress this aspect of attachment to a land, to a, a specific region, also will imply certain exclusion of the people who are not from that land or from, from that region. And uh, I was quoting the French uh, philosopher Emmanuel Levinas uh, that made this reflection about uh, this concept of place. And of course, from his Jewish perspective, I would say that uh, uh, never this concept of place was very strong in Judaism. In the contrary, it was always seen as a temptation, as something that uh, could link, for instance, the God to a specific uh, place. Uh, and uh, the experience of the exile, in particular, uh, was very crucial to detach uh, the Jewish tradition from this idea of, of a land, of a territory in which uh, all the sacred value could be attached. Uh. And I'm not surprised that uh, Levinas have, have stressed that. I think it's coherent with his own uh, uh, tradition and, and his own philosophy. Uh, he saw, all excited by he was by the uh, Gagarin exploit. You see, the fact that for the first time in 1961, there was somebody in space. He saw that technique could free ourselves from this attachment to land. And uh, like he says, uh, technique suppress the privilege of rootedness uh, and also of the concept of exile who is correlative to rootedness. Uh, or you are rooted or you could be exiled. Uh, and he says technique have, have freed us from that. Here is a man who is suspended in the middle of nowhere in space without horizon. Uh, with space below him and above him and uh, on the left and the right and it's, this is an extraordinary uh, uh, feeling uh, and he was uh, all excited by this idea. But of course, uh, when after nobody make the objection but then there's not many of us who will ever have this experience you see of being in the middle of nowhere like this, like Gagarin or like any other astronauts. And uh, maybe there's other means to get something of that nature, uh, experience of that nature, who are less costly and, and less difficult techni technically, if you want. And indeed, there's one, I would say, and this is precisely what I want to suggest tonight, this uh, possibility of uh, stressing the importance of the interior space, uh, of what we can imagine, of what we can dream of, is a way to get to a space in which there's no special attachment to a land or to a region and where there's no uh, this stand of exclusivity from the others. Uh, of course, much more individualized if you want, but it's, it's a thing that it's not costly to do and that we do, uh, I would say, uh, all the time when we dream, when we uh, think of, of, of this internal world. Uh, and and Bordeaux was very conscious of that. He says in a, 
you know, in the Manifesto Refus Global, you have many, many texts. And in one of the texts, it's called Commentaire sur les mots courants. And it's a little lexicon, in a way, in which uh, Bordeaux explained uh, in his manner, sometimes just quoting the Le Petit Larousse, uh, the, the little dictionary, French dictionary uh, definition, but sometimes uh, getting more involved with, with a subject that interested him. And in this commentaire des mots cour sur les mots courants, there is uh, an article or an item, if you want, who is called tableau, painting. Uh, in which he says, okay, the tableau, the painting is something who have not much importance. It doesn't uh, avoid people to uh, die from hunger or from, of, uh, it doesn't stop wars and things like that. But nevertheless, he says, the painting, if you take it in the whole history of it, have um, little by little uh, make us understand what was the space, what was sky, what was the light, what was the movement. And in a way, he makes, in a brief uh, uh, way, uh, a history of, of painting since the beginning. You see the kind of uh, uh, the um, taming of all these concepts you see of, of nature, of exterior nature. And then he says, okay, we have maybe uh, taken uh, 15th century to understand the external world external world, uh, maybe we will need as much to understand the internal world. And he had, but I am convinced that painting could make this world, this internal world, as familiar as the physical world, even if it could take centuries of a future civilization. And so he saw, in a way, his own painting as a kind of exploration of this internal world. And uh, that's why we could call it inscape instead of landscape. Uh, it, the word was created by Mata, uh, who is a, a famous uh, Chilean uh, surrealist painter uh, that used it in few of his uh, pictures. He have also mindscape, which is a good idea also. It's a good uh, term, uh, kind of neologism that he created. Uh, and uh, what I want to, to retrace to you to, tonight, it is to see how Bartuan def uh, find uh, a way toward this internal world uh, for himself, if you want. And for this, we have to start with uh, the importance of surrealism and especially of what is called automatic writing. Uh, I will try to explain that as clearly as possible. And you will see that step by step we will go toward uh, his painting. But I think we have to begin uh, by putting this concept a little bit uh, clearer. Uh, the, the beginning of what we call automatic writing, of course, is a surrealist invention. It's not Canadian. It's done by André Breton, uh, the, the famous uh, poet, French poet, and also the, the, the founder of the surrealist movement in France. And uh, he tell, he gave two, uh, let's say, two versions of the way he himself discovered this automatic writing. The first one, he says that he was in a period of his life in which uh, he didn't eat enough, and it was a very ter terrible, uh, with a lot of difficulty and all that to survive. And he says, maybe because of the hunger, because of that, I suddenly have a phrase who came to my mind. He says, I don't remember it uh, exactly. So uh, all historians uh, get excited. Why he didn't write it down? And, uh, because it's really the creation of a very important thing. But he says, it was something like, I saw a man cut in half by a window. Uh, a phrase like this that just emerged in a conscious in the consciousness uh, because of uh, eating of this hunger and he quotes Knut uh, uh, Hansun who is a, I think a Norwegian um, uh, novelist who wrote a famous novel it's called The Hunger uh, and in which Hansen also says exactly the same thing. He says, uh, because of this hunger, I had sometimes a fantastic uh, spree of uh, writing very fast like this, wonderful ideas and all that. This is my, my pencil was not going fast enough to, to note all these uh, beautiful pieces of literature that I, that I could make. Uh, and, in, and this, of course, what they will begin to call automatic writing because it has, if it's very spontaneous, it's not controlled, and it seems to come from, uh, from outside of yourself in a way, huh? that uh, you don't have to pay any attention, it's that the words are just coming on and flowing like this from your pen or pencil uh, easily. And indeed, there is a connection there with spiritism. Huh? 
what the spirits, uh, do you call them that way? Yeah, spirits, the, the people who, with the, that's why I have a table probably tonight also. I didn't think of it, but, but it, it goes with a table too. The spirit had this idea of what they call l'écriture directe. I read that in French, but you, direct writing, if you want. And this was, of course, uh, this thing you see, you will have suddenly a pencil. I will not do it, I'm not a spirit, but uh, a pencil will, will uh, stand by itself and will write a message. Uh, this is l'écriture directe. But then the most common, of course, this you need some trickery. Uh, you need darkened and, uh, and uh, wire. Uh, anyway, but this is, this is uh, more complicated. But the other thing that was very common, it is that the, the spirit or the medium, let's say, will be there and it will say, okay, I try to, to maintain my hand, but I cannot not write. And look, this is not my writing. I write habitually like this. And this is, I don't know where it comes from. It's certainly some spirit uh, uh, in me that gives this message to you. Your father is angry at you, and that's why he died. Well, anyway, whatever, whatever story they, they, can, they can tell you. Huh? And so the origin of Écriture Automatique, you see, I have these connection with this, with this kind of spirit, uh, uh, kind of séance, uh, atmosphere and all that. And I'm sure that Breton liked it, this connection because anything spooky and a little bit different was exciting for him. Then he gave another, uh, another version of the same, of the beginning of the same experience. He says, at the time I was reading Freud. And he says, I, uh, because Breton, if we have to know that, before being the poet th th that he was, uh, was also, I've made some studies in medicine, and he was at the time uh, at the Hôpital du Val de Grasse. Uh, it was during the war, of the First World War, and uh, he was in the section of neuropsychiatry. So I guess uh, to read Freud at the time would have made sense. And he says, I wanted to do uh, to myself what we do habitually with our patient. Meaning that uh, at the time what he understood of, of the technique of Freud was to ask the, the patient to make a free association. You see, for instance, you will give uh, a series of words, uh, uh, fish, and you wait, and the guy says, uh, I'm hungry, or anyway. So he make an association with, with, the, word, uh, with the word you, you, you use. And he says, uh, uh, and then, he says also during the, the, the psychoanalytic cure, habitually the, uh, the, the patient is asked to just tell whatever crosses his mind without any control, uh, don't be shy, you can speak of anything, especially of sex, of course, uh, yeah, otherwise why to go to a psychoanalyst? Uh, and, and, the, uh, and be very free, just tell whatever he says. And he says, I wanted to obtain from myself this type of discourse that I get from, from the patients. Uh, and uh, thinking that that way, he will get the kind of wonderful image, uh, metaphor, if you want, that could be used poetically. Huh? Uh, in fact, it was a not a very uh, uh, clever interpretation of Freud. I think this is important to understand because you could say that Écriture Automatique, as understood by Breton, uh, lays on a kind of misunderstanding of, of the Freud uh, uh, approach. In the, the book on the uh, Traum and Dung, uh, Deutung, uh, on the interpretation of, of dream, Freud explained that there is uh, what we call the manifest dream. So this is the, the way when you dream, the, the way you tell it. You see, it's a kind of a story which is hard to believe, uh, full of absurdity and all that. But he says below that, there's a kind of Latin dream. And what we try to do by this association, by this free association, is to get to the Latin dream, to the, to the under dream, if you want. And what we ask habitually the, 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 the patient, it is to associate, to free associate with each segment of the dream, whatever come to his mind. In folly, and the kind of uh, idea that fell, that uh, just happens uh, to your mind, in association with this element and this one and this one. And with this, suddenly, 
each part of the dream, instead of looking absurd, begins to make sense, begins to connect with the others, and as if what, what you see in the dream, what, what you remember of it, is just a kind of very small layers, and below it, there's a lot of uh, unconscious problems, uh, desire and whatever, that we can finally make sense with. So in a way, what uh, Freud was suggesting, this, what the unconscious could reveal, it's a more logical and less absurd type of uh, reci, if you want a type of story, than the one we have in the manifest dream, in the dream that uh, we are conscious of and that we can tell to, to the doctor. Uh, and what Breton was uh, looking about, it was not this logical dream, it was just the Latin dream. He wanted through this to have even more absurd thing, more difficult thing to associate and more, and, and to spread it even, even more. Uh, his notion of this, in fact, is much closer to another psychoanalyst, uh, another psychologist, let's say, Pierre Janet, who was French, and who was uh, almost the rival of Freud at the time also. And Janet is the one who used the word subconscious. Huh? You never see that in Freud. Freud speaks of unconscious, unconscious. Huh? And subconscious, the hypothesis of Janet was that if you go deeper in the uh, uh, human psyche, you will find more disorganization, more uh, chaos, if you want. Huh? And uh, he says, for instance, a neurotic person is somebody where his subconscious have taken over, and that's why it's all disorganized and all that. In Freud, it's not true. In Freud, the unconscious is conflictual, is organized in a way through whatever you have been through in your childhood and all that, and it's not at all a kind of disaggregation of, of mental uh, mind uh, like Janet uh, used to say. But for Breton, who read, let's say, Freud through Janet, uh, because that's what he, what he understood better. And the use, of course, of the word subconscious is very typical of, of, uh, of his reading. I think he thought, well, this is fantastic because if we go deeper, we get more chaotic and more disorganized. I will have a more wonderful type of, uh, of image. You see rapprochement absolutely bizarre and new that nobody have done before. And this is exactly what I want to do. And, and in a way, is. Uh, far from Freud, because he see it as a kind of disorganization, but also far from Janet, because for Janet, of course, the disorganization in question is the thing to heal, is the thing to, to repress uh, and, and not to encourage. Uh. And so Breton will say, no, in the contrary, we have discovered the unity of human mind there in this kind of chaotic state and all that, and this is primitive, this is fresh, this is exactly the beginning of all poetry. And he called uh, one of his books, Les Champs Magnétiques, the magnetic fields, if you want, because of that, because at that level, let's say, every image attracts itself, you can have all the combination you can imagine, and this is exactly what poetry is, is all about. Uh, okay, so how do you do this um, uh, <laughs> automatic writing for real, you see? I will read you the, the text of Breton where, where he, he gives you the la recette, in fact, uh, how, to, how to proceed. And then I will give you a few examples of the result, okay? So Breton starts like this, he says, have somebody bring to you uh, papers to write on. <laughs> this is extraordinary. I think uh, only Breton can, can have somebody bring him paper. I, could, I would not dare to ask anybody. But <laughs> it's after having settled in a place as favorable as possible for the concentration of your spirit. Put yourself in as passive or receptive a mood as possible. Forget about your genius, your talents, and the one of any other. Be convinced that literature is the saddest way to achieve anything. <laughs> yeah, it's probably right. Write fast without any preconceived idea, fast enough anyway to forget what you just wrote and to curb the temptation to read yourself back. Okay, write very fast. The first phrase will come by itself since it is sure that at each moment there is a phrase alien to our consciousness that just demands to express itself. I try that uh, in class, you see. I, I never do it anymore, but so don't worry, I will not ask you to do any automatic. 
what happened, of course, I didn't, any student asked me to bring them their paper, of course not. But I said, okay, let's try to do this. Everybody, okay, I give you five minutes, write to me some uh, example of uh, automatic writing. Then I gathered uh, the, the paper and begins to read this. I said, oh my God, okay, oh no, not this one, not this one. So what, what happened, it was something like, uh, what are we doing here? Why he ask us to do that? Um, so I was expecting, you see, les poissons solubles or something like that, a kind of wonderful metaphor, a surrealist metaphor. But, so I realized that when he says, uh, find a place uh, favorable to the concentration of your mind, this was not a classroom. <laughs> and uh, you have to be alone and you have to, uh, anyway. There, there is indeed a, pr a problem of, with, with this technique because when it's done by Breton, by Soupeau, people like that, it's wonderful. <laughs> they, they make text absolutely incredible. But when it's done with people with less imagination, I don't mean that students have less imagination, <laughs> but uh, let's say, uh, or, or a, a, a less uh, control of the language, whatever, whatever the reason, the results are not always uh, very uh, striking. The, the, the main idea there, if, if I summarize, and you will see this is important also for painting, it is that this thing starts without any preconceived idea. Uh, uh, when he says forget about your genius, your talents, and literature, and everything, he means basically uh, forget, uh, don't have a project, because if, if you have in head, okay, I must write about something, then it's no more automatic. Uh, it, 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 it have to be really, like he says, we have a phrase, we just wait to be expressed, and if we, if we don't uh, interfere, and if we just let it go, in another text he explained also, if suddenly the, the speed of improvisation becomes to slow down, just put L and continue. Uh, because in French, of course, L will be the le la le will be the, the first letter of the article, and I guess in English you could say just put T and the the the, and and you will you will continue. Uh, the only uh, hello. Of course, the uh, the type of text that you obtain like this uh, is, is special. Uh, and I will try to define it. Let me give you first an example. It's uh, from the uh, uh, the recueil, the, the kind of essays uh, published by Breton. It's called Poisson Soluble. Uh, you could say dissolving fish. Oh, wow, this is wonderful. You say a fish who is soluble in water would be uh, in a terrible fate. Huh? You will not understand. <laughs> but, and all, uh, just a little piece, uh, just to give you the, the feeling of the type of image and metaphor that you obtain in that way when you are brought of course. In the chalk of, of a school, there is a sewing machine. Okay. The small children shake their locks of silver paper. The sky is a blackboard tragically erased minute by minute by the wind. And it goes on like this for pages and pages. And at first, of course, the uh, the, uh, the text seems absurd a little bit. Huh? And there is a, a wonderful definition of the type of image you have there by Pierre Riverdi, who is a French poet uh, who published a little magazine at the time, it's called Nord Sud. And Riverdi uh, defined very well this type of imagery that you have in surrealist text. He says, we are used of metaphor who are basically comparison. Uh, for instance, if I say tears are like pearls, if I say uh, a drop of dew is like uh, tears, or I compare. Uh, and, and then it will, it will be poetic if you want, but it will be a little bit passé, it will be boring in a way. If you go on and on with these type of, of image that have been used thousands of times, it will be boring. But, but the idea, this type of metaphor is based on a comparison. But he says the metaphor you get in these uh, surrealist texts are made, made by a rapprochement. Uh, instead of a comparison, you put together two realities who are far apart in the real world, if you want, and you bring them together. Uh, and then, if he says, if the distance between the two realities is very big, and if they are really far apart, the image will be even more striking and more emotionally touching, in a way. Uh, when he says, in the chalk, in a piece of chalk at school, there is a sewing machine. Okay, you put together 
a chart, uh, uh, and a sewing machine, and then at first sight, okay, there's just a rapprochement. There's no comparison between both. Huh? Uh, one doesn't look like the other, but there is a rapprochement between these two things, and the more the, the text goes, the small children, the silver, okay, the silver is white like the chalk. You begin to find a lot of connections, but who are not logical, huh? who are rather kind of... Uh, uh, rapprochement, and, and then indeed there is a kind of emotion in, in these type of texts that is special and that the uh, surrealists were, were eager uh, to find. Okay, this is wh when we, we try to define poetry and literature as automatist writing. I think this is more or less uh, what we get. But what about painting? Uh, how do you do that in painting? And uh, uh, Breton, on, on this subject, of course, he's a poet, and not much to say, but he make an allusion to, of all people, to a Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, of course he did it in purpose because uh, to surprise people, but apparently in the uh, notebooks of Leonardo, and, and not apparently because I find it there also, it, it's there, uh, Leonardo gave an advice to his students in which he says, okay, if you are looking for a subject matter in a painting, look to an old wall with cracks and, and spots and, and say a, a very whole wall. And then if you look at it a little bit distractly, with time you will see suddenly shapes and, and subject uh, of painting that will appear. And he says, uh, just, you just have to copy them and you have already your, your subject matter. Uh, and Breton gets all excited by that. He says, well, this is exactly the resolution of the opposition between subjectivity and objectivity. Uh, it's the technique of inspiration uh, itself and all that. You get, you get very excited like this in a text uh, uh, in Chateau Etoile. That was read by Bordua, by the way. Bordua knew that text, he, he read it there. Uh, okay, so if you analyze a little bit why you say subjectivity and objectivity are together, in a way, the wall is objective. It's something that everybody could see. Uh, there is indeed cracks in it and there is spots of, of colors or whatever. Of, uh, and this is uh, something that you, you, can, you can check. But the projection that each individual will do on it, this is subjective. Uh, one will see a, a shape of horses, let's say, another will see people, another will see... It's the experience that uh, we have done, all of us, uh, looking at clouds. Uh, you have always some, uh, I remember, uh, peanuts, uh, uh, caricature in which uh, you see, uh, I think Charlie Brown's looking at cloud and says, I see a ducky and a horsey. And of course, Linus see, I see the stoning of St. Stephen in the, <laughs> and, uh, each one with his own imagination, of course, uh, uh, projecting in the same, uh, the same device. Huh? That's why, for instance, the uh, Dali or other people call it a paranoiac screen. Huh? Uh, a screen in which you project content uh, a little bit like in a paranoia, it's the delirium of uh, uh, where, where you reinterpret all your relation with other people as if they were suddenly your enemy. So you reinterpret whatever you lived before and, uh, and, and whatever you see also. So it's, it's the same, same type of things here was happening in this old wall, this old cracked wall. You can project whatever unconscious content that you want. So you make this kind of... Uh, a synthesis, if you want, between objectivity, the wall, uh, what it is there, and subjectivity, what you brought, brought to it. Huh? And uh, for Breton, this was very simple. You just have to copy your vision. Huh? Yeah, but for painters, well, this is not great, you know, because to copy the vision, how do you do this? Huh? Especially that if you were doing it uh, carefully, uh, there was a problem, and there was a big difference then with, with poets. It is the, the speed of improvisation. Uh, a poet who writes writing, uh, automatic writing can do it like this at the, at the speed of the pen and make a poem in, in, in five minutes. But if you are there looking and then trying to copy what you see, uh, then you will end up with a lot of problem, technical and all that. A little bit like in Dali picture, for instance. Huh? You, 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 you get the impression that he, 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 he cannot get to his type of picture by just improvising fast and, and things like that. So this question, uh, how do you transpose automatic writing will be dealt by the painters, of course. They will try to find something. And basically, they will find two ways. One will be 
to uh, count on the speed of the eye, of what the, the connection that the eye can do. And the other will be more gestural, will, will, uh, will let's say, work more with what the hand can do, I would say. I, we could oppose these two methods. Uh, as I will explain, Bordeaux belongs rather to the second category. But I think it's important to see the first one because, after all, this was more what the surrealists in France uh, or in, in, in Europe did. And that was more or less also the model that the Canadian painters here could have and wanted to, to uh, let's say, take distance with, uh, to, to, be, to be themselves. Uh. The, the master of... Um, of uh, this first uh, uh, approach, if you want, will be Max Ernst, uh, the, the uh, German-born uh, uh, painter, but who lived a lot in Paris and was quite close to the Surrealist. And what he will uh, do, basically, it's collage. Uh, and if you think of collage, uh, you will see that right away it's a good way to get to the type of metaphor I was describing in the, in the Surrealist poetry. Because what, what uh, Hans did, he took, um, let's say, a magazine or even catalogs of things in which you could uh, cut with a scissors a certain image, and then you have on your table uh, f uh, five, ten, or one hundred of these little images, and then you can combine them rapidly, and then you just have to glue them on, on, on a piece of paper, and you obtain kind of hybrid shapes you, you obtain in a way, like uh, in the poem that I was quoting before, a blackboard erased by the wind, or say, whatever combination that could come, but through images already done and found uh, already drawn. So I will show you a few examples of this uh, to, oops, uh, <laughs> to start with. And... Uh, Ah, okay. So this is a, a first. Thing. It's the hat that makes the man. Okay, I can. You, you can guess the, the title here. It's not too, too difficult. Of 1920, this is a real collage, meaning that really what he did, he uh, he took uh, probably a catalogue of uh, fashion. I would say of men fashion, in which you have hats of any shapes, and uh, he uh, he cut them out uh, with, with, with a pair of scissors and then glued them. And then, of course, he have added to, uh, to what we see there some lines and some color who were not in the original source and added a little text in the bottom, and you have a, a collage. Huh? Uh, this is a real collage, meaning that uh, really uh, th there is this uh, first uh, uh, of uh, getting to material and all that and then to assembling it and trying to make sense with this type of things. Huh? The, uh, the interpretation of, of this, of course, have been, uh, of, you could imagine, a little bit, because the Surrealists are so close to Freudian uh, approach that uh, critics are ready also to find some Freudian content in this, and so kind of phallic symbol in the hat and the, all these tubes, and even these little protruding things on the side, love, <laughs> if you follow the tube, so, oops, suddenly you are a little spitz there. But okay, so then I, I, I don't have to, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, give too much details. There was this uh, type of interpretation. For instance, Lucy Leppard uh, wrote, the hat covers the head, formally it resembled the cover of the head of the male organ. Uh, it's also a repressive factor, a cover-up, an overlay of civilization on the seat of subconscious. Yeah. One tip, one's hat, uncover, bear oneself briefly when saying good day, when communicating with others, especially ladies. Uh, that I view the European man in 1920 as a stack-up seedless puppet or mannequin. It's true that the theme of the mannequin is very, very uh, common in surrealist art. And, okay, you could say that... Uh, uh, here Ernst uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, referring to that. Now you have another type. Uh, oh, I to uh, yeah. You have another type here who is a, a little bit more difficult to explain. Okay, the title here will not help. It's called The Dissolvable Snail. Huh? In, in fact, the title is much longer if, if you read it in the bottom and the top there. It's in French, Le Limaçon de Chambre Fusible et le Coeur de la Moissonneuse Légère à la Course. Blah, 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 blah. It goes like this. I will not translate that. It, it doesn't give. A, it's like a, a, a surrealist poem 
attached to the painting. Uh, it's not a title in the sense that it will give you a subject matter. But there, Ernst have proceeded very differently. This is not a real collage. Uh, this is what he used to call Hubert Malerey, <laughs> overpainting. Okay, why? Because he took a page in one of these catalogs that he had, and uh, a heart historian, I've discovered the source of this. We know exactly wh wh what he got. It, it's a kind of uh, a catalog for pedagogical instruments. Huh? Uh, in, in the case here, I don't have my little uh, spotlight tonight, but I will go there. In the case here, you, have, you, can re you can recognize here probably a heart. Huh? And here, some uh, bones of, the, of a horse with, with his teeth. Huh? And well, here, this is a larynx of a, a, with mounted on a, on a kind of pedestal like this. So what it is, in fact, what is this point de part, if you want what he start with, it's a page uh, of advertisement for a sculpture, little sculpture or little demonstration piece for a course of veterina veterinary uh, medicine in which uh, the students have to learn what is the shape of the heart of the horse, what is his teeth, and what is, and if you look carefully on the bottom left, you will see the shape of the head of a horse. Or is it just me who see it? No? <laughs> uh, it's like on the side like this. So, uh, in fact, and, and this head of the horse was also mounted on a little uh, stick like this that you see that he overpainted abo above it. So what he did, he took the page as it is, and he find it that the, the association is so weird and so funny that he just covered, that's why he called it overpaint, uh, he covers some part and add few lines and few colors and all that to uh, make it uh, in a kind of completely different uh, presentation. Uh, so this is not a real collage, but it works like a collage in a way because it brings together things that are far apart and, and make them function in a kind of completely different uh, type of background. He had it, of course, the, the kind of cube is behind who gives some space to it. And uh, then the little poem uh, was added to that, make it even more, more strange, more, more, uh, more bizarre. Huh? But if you think again of the definition that Riverdi was giving and that I was quoting before about the, uh, the surrealist metaphor, what, what it is, it is a kind of rapprochement. I think this is a perfect example of that in picture. Huh? Uh, a few other examples, just, I, I, I don't have, uh, okay, here again, you see this, it looks like faces, like uh, some mask or things like that. But these were uh, a page of a catalog advertising equipment for uh, welding. You see, for uh, you need these goggles, uh, and you need this mask and things like that. And he, he took it. And again, there's no piece glued there. It's just a page itself transformed. And he, he gave him a title uh, of uh, ambiguous figure, wh which is, uh, if you want. Uh, and then again, the little... Uh, poem at the bottom. It's, it's not big painting. Huh? They are big about like this, like the page of the catalog that he used. Huh? It's not, not bigger than that. In this case, he reversed the page that he used, you see, and this was uh, uh, a kind of physicalish uh, apparat. Okay, that I guess it's a, a apparatus for a physics class, for, for a class in physics. Again, it's pedagogical instruments. You see that uh, this firm was selling to all the school in Germany, and he got his hand on these type of, uh, of uh, catalogs and advertisement. And he, okay, he put the page upside down, then he linked all these apparatus, one with the other with this color, and at the end, or sometimes he suppress also part of them to make them more strange, and he called it demonstration hydrométrique, à tuer la température, huh? uh, a kind of hydrometric demonstration to kill weather, huh? kind of like a machine to, to kill weather. But if you, if you realize that the page is upside down, I think you will understand better the, uh, the, uh, the source of which he used. Huh? He did also, of course, a real, uh, uh, real collage uh, with, uh, I would say, almost novels in collage. Huh? Uh, for, for instance, in, in that one, it's called, it, it's, a, it's a series of these uh, collage that he had made, and it's called La Femme Sans Tête, 
which of course is not very nice, but he write uh, the woman 100 heads, uh, not but cent, not without head, but with, with 100 in French. Cent uh, is written like uh, so. At least uh, we can save him of uh, not to be anti-feminist on this. Huh? But yeah, okay. So again, these pictures are done with uh, uh, with engravings already existing, but by gluing some element in them, it make them very, very strange. Like this one is called the woman with a hundred heads. Open her August sleeve. And indeed, if you follow her left arm, you will see that suddenly uh, a kind of naked man get out of these sleeves. Huh? She opened her, her sleeve, but then suddenly you see a tie and, a, and two feet uh, appearing there. There's a cactus down there that certainly was not in the, in the first uh, uh, picture. And uh, maybe also he reverse it, he put it vertical when it was probably horizontal to start with. So there's a kind of manipulation of the image and gluing like this to obtain this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, strange uh, type of, of space. And here I have two examples. This one we have seen three times already, but there it is. <laughs> the, uh, Une semaine de bonté, uh, uh, again, because I want to show you two together because they are really like, you, you buy, it's like a book, huh? and you live through it, and you have all these images, one after the other, giving you like this uh, uh, scenes who are always weird, uh, a little bit like dream, huh, in a way. You will see, if I dream like this, I'm, I'm really sick, I should see a, uh, a doctor, but anyway. The, uh, you see, in the left one, you have a kind of very strange personage with, the, with a face who is hard to read that is looking toward us. And then the Sphinx, of course, looking intensely to him. But you realize that on the, at his feet, there's somebody dead there. And uh, so maybe it's kind of uh, incarnation of his guilt. But he doesn't seem too, uh, too guilty. I just look very casual, like this, looking at the public. And in the other, you have a bedroom, and this is important, of course, because that makes connection with uh, dream, uh, with, with uh, sleep. And then suddenly this uh, hang uh, bird or man, half bird, half man, appear. And in the uh, little table there, you see a dog. Uh, the, the decoration of the table was a kind of Rococo type of, of things suddenly turn as a dog and with a rooster above to complete the, the presentation. Uh, then, but it's so well integrated, I would say. The picture that at first you, you, you feel that it's just a strange picture, but it, it, the collage is well done and each element is added. And plus, then it's printed in a book, so that means the if, if you were uh, seeing the real collage, you may not see exactly the, uh, uh, you, you will see exactly where, where some, some elements have been glued on the paper. But when it's printed, of course, it's mixed, uh, it it's disappeared more in the page, and it doesn't stand out like element uh, of glued. Uh, okay, this is, I would say, uh, the, I, was, I was telling you that the, the first way to transpose automatic writing, it's through technique of that kind of collage. Huh? In the case of Helms, of course, he, he had wonderful, I think he made thousands of these uh, little collages like this. All of them are very uh, curious and interesting and all that. They are very difficult to interpret, really, because in a way, there are so many of them, they are so crazy, and uh, we, don't, uh, we don't know much about his own uh, uh, childhood and all that, but in one case, of René Magritte, then we, have, we can go deeper in the kind of interpretation of this type of scenes. And I wanted to give you a few examples of Magritte's work because uh, you will see, in a way, uh, another way to treat with the same type of... Uh... Okay, this René Magritte, uh, it, it's a collage, in fact, again. It's called Le, Le Jockey Perdu, the, the Lost Jockey. Uh, you see it in the middle, and uh, at, at first sight, it's much more organized than Max Ernst's things. Huh? It has more familiar in a way, but also suddenly stranger. Huh? You have, okay, it's like a theater. You have two curtains on each side, and then in the middle, you see this jockey with his horse and, and seemingly trying to, to, to speed up, but he seems very uh, static. He seems almost stuck there. 
And indeed, you see on the ground, there is kind of uh, lines who looks like a spider web in a way that seems to stuck him, to, to, to make him uh, uh, static and, and to stop him there in the middle of the picture. And then around him, at first sight, you say this is trees, but then if you look more carefully, these trees look like, and then really, I had to look in the dictionary, I have no idea what it was in English, a bilboque. I will describe what it is. It's a kind of, you have a stick and a little ball, and the stick end up as a kind of a cup like this, and you are supposed to, to send the ball up and then to catch it, and it will fall on it. This is a bilboque. Huh? And this is what he have represented here. This bilboque, you see the forest suddenly are done with these strange things. And one of the journalists asked once to, to uh, Magritte, uh, why you put bilboque like this? I think the, the, the word in English, if my dictionary is right, is cup and ball game. Does it make sense? No? Why? Cup and ball game. And uh, anyway, it's uh, this little thing that with. Uh, and. Uh, the, uh, the journalist asked him, so why do you put these strange thing in your painting? And, and Magritte answered, he said, the bilboque is not strange. He says, this is a thing that uh, children play with. And uh, he says, this is not, uh, I don't put strange thing in my painting. I put very familiar thing in my painting. But the relation of things in the painting is unfamiliar. And this is why you think it's bizarre. The object, it's true, the, all, all of the, all the object here are in a way familiar, but it is the reunion there who is, who is strange. And the, the commentary that we do habitually about this Bill Bocquet thing, okay, if you are Freudian, of course you say, oh, right away this is a phallic symbol, so it will, it will go. But we think in the, in the contrary, this is a modern symbol in, in Magritte uh, uh, picture, and I will tell you why. Uh, let's see another example where you see the Bill Bocquet. Uh, yeah. Where you see here on the left, and, and this again it's called Le Savoir. Uh, and the, the choice of the billboard of this uh, cup and ball game as a symbol, of a maternal symbol, if you want, in Magritte, can be explained by the fact that Madame Magritte, the mother of Magritte, was uh, uh, a rather sick person. She had uh, uh, what they used to call at the time neurasthenia, but uh, what we will call today a, a severe depression, so much that uh, when Magritte was 13 years old, she committed suicide. And uh, Magritte never spoke of, of the circumstances of, of uh, his mother's death and all that, except once when he pretended, I said pretend, you will see why, that he find her in the river uh, floating with her nightgown uh, on his head. And indeed, you have many pictures of Magritte in which you see somebody with uh, a veil on his head. No? And uh, I says he pretended because it was demonstrated that he was not there when the corpse was found. So it's a kind of false memory. Huh? You know that this thing has happened. Also, people think they remember some traumatic experience, but it's not based on fact. And it's a kind of false memory. I never spoke of it. And of course, it was very adamant to say any type of psychoanalytic explanation of my painting is, is crazy. I have nothing to do with what I'm doing. He is very, very aggressive to any type of uh, approach like the one I'm suggesting here. In fact, if you think of it, of the Bill Bocquet, what it is exactly, it's a kind of, if you symbolize, let's say, the child by the ball there, is, is thrown and, and catch up and thrown and catch up, because the, the, the variation of moves that this poor mother could have, you see, before committing suicide must have been tremendous, and for a kid of uh, six, seven, eight years old, he could not really relate why she's so angry now, why she's so apathetic now, and how he could relate to that. And in a way, the Bill Bocquet was a good example of, uh, of this maternal type of symbol. And indeed, in this picture, the shape of the bilboquet looks much more feminine than in the previous one. And finally, when you will go back uh, to the theme of, uh, of the jockey perdu, the bilboquet will be replaced by this dead tree. Huh? And, and he will be reduced even more in a kind of little personage like this at the very, uh, uh, at the horizon. Huh? And, uh, and then you could say from one painting to the other, he explore is unconscious, but in a much more structured fashion than 
uh, what Ernst was suggesting. Uh, with Ernst, it's more wild, it's more difficult to, to uh, narrow it down to something, but in Magritte, it's very systematic, and it's also very often a kind of uh, irreflection on painting itself, on its power, on what it can, uh, can reveal. But it's quite close to this definition that was given of the surrealist metaphor as a kind of rapprochement. Okay, the other, the other uh, way to, to get to the, the same unconscious thing was what I used, uh, what I called before, to give a chance to the and instead of the high. Uh, that's to go more to a gestural way to, to paint instead of uh, just associating image like these painters and uh, habitually the European tradition of surrealism have done. Uh. And there, I think, uh, uh, Bordua uh, will be important. Okay, I will show you one painting of his a kind of gouache that he called La Machine à Coudre. Huh? And uh, of course, this is interesting as a title because uh, uh, it's uh, probably an allusion to uh, a famous line by Lautréamont, a poet that the surrealists used to like very much, in which he says, beau comme la rencontre fortuite uh, d'un parapluie et d'une machine à coudre sur une table de dissection. Okay, translation. <laughs> Beautiful, like the uh, encounter of a sewing machine and an umbrella on a dissection table. Yeah, you can say that. And um, so La Machine à Coudre will be like uh, uh, the sewing machine who could be a team that uh, will be interested for, uh, uh, for surrealists or for people like Bordeaux influenced by surrealism. And uh, this gouache is, it was done in 1942 and it's the first of a series. Uh, he exhibited them at L'Hermitage at um, uh, nearby here on uh, Peel Street, if you want, when you go up, it's still written like this, L'Hermitage. It was a kind of, um, I would say, a gymnasium for the Collège de Montréal, just nearby. It was not really a gallery or a museum and things like that, but, but they used that. And he showed 45 of them, and most of them, when he showed them, were just titled by number. Uh, number one, two, three. This is number one, but with time, sometimes with, with the influence of collector or, or, or because he, he sell one, he decided to give him also a literary title. Huh? Uh, I could imagine to a collector go back to his wife and he says, okay, what do you buy? What do you buy? Number 22. <laughs> what is the title? You say, 22. Uh, so I guess he made some concession. So this one was called La Machine à Coudre. But he explained also the way he did this gouache. Huh? And uh, this is a, a fam well, a relatively famous text in which it's an interview that my dear father at the time did with Bordua, and I, I find it, of course, in his papers, and I find it very interesting because it was done just after the gouache were done. So it's very close to, to what it is. And, and Gagnon at the time, Maurice Gagnon, my father, asked him, uh, what, uh, how, how do you proceed to make this gouache? So, what was your technique? How, how do you do? So Bordeaux answered this. And you will see, I will re read the, what, what he says, and you will see how precisely the, uh, the gesture becomes much more important here than just what the high could do. And Bordeaux starts by saying, I have no preconceived idea. In front of the blank page, with the mind free from any literary ideas, I obey to the first impulsion. If I have the idea to put my charcoal in the middle of the page, or if one of its side, I do it without hesitation, and I go on like this. A first stroke is drawn that way, dividing the page. This division of the page starts a whole process of thought which are executed as automatically as the rest. I speak of thought, but of course I mean painter's thought, thought of movement, of rhythm, of volume, of light, and not of literary or philosophical or social thought, because one cannot use them through, uh, as they are if they are not plastically transposed. When the drawing is finished, I follow the same process for the color. If my first idea is to use a green or a red, I do not object. It is at this stage of the color that the problem of space, of movement, and of light becomes to uh, be handled, and, and so on. Okay? I will make four remarks about this interview, about uh, this text, let's say. 
First of, first of all, uh, it's important to see what Bordeaux understands by automatic uh, painting, uh, automatism, if you want. The main idea is the non-preconceived. Uh, it is, you start a painting with <coughs> oh no, without any specific idea of what it will be. Uh, you have to imagine a blank uh, page completely, and like he says, I take my charcoal and I make a line any place. And indeed, in that case, I could even guess where the line was done the first. I think because he put his, his uh, paper like this horizontally, you would see the, the line could just follow the signs of the picture. Take a first line, it will go like this, and then a second line will go like this, a third one there, and a fourth one there. <coughs> As if the format on which he works and the fact that the, the painting is put that way already more or less uh, uh, give him incentive to trace his first line. And indeed, in this one, what is wide there is the paper. Uh, it's not painting. And maybe not from where you are, but in front, when you are in front of the reading, you can see the trace of his charcoal, indeed, of the, of the line that he speak of that was done uh, that way. Uh. So uh, this is certainly the, 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 first, uh, the first idea. It is that it's autom if it's automatic, it's done without preconceived idea. A line is traced like this. Indeed, maybe the first line will make it a completely abstract painting, in fact. Uh, but then it's less and less automatic with the second line, the third one, the fourth one. Because the more you go, the more the things get organized there. Uh, uh, this is one of the remarks that Molinari did about these gouache. He says, he, Bordeaux calls it very automatic, but in fact, he is controlling with his eyes what the second line will be and what the third one and what the third, the fourth. Uh, autrement dit, in other words, if you want, the more he goes, the more control he, he gets. Uh, the first impulse, of course, is completely free and, and could be any, anywhere on the, on the canvas or there on a sheet of paper, since it's a gouache. Huh? And, but with time, there's more and more control, and at, at the end, you could say, well, it's completely uh, in his hand, he knows exactly where he goes, and, and things like that. Okay, then the, uh, and of course, it's through this, this spontaneity, if you want, of this kind of uh, non-preconceived stand that he takes, that you could say that this type of picture could reveal the unconscious. But then the unconscious in Bordeaux is understood rather like energy, like pulsion, I would say, rather than just images. Huh? It's a less Lacanian <laughs> unconscious, less close to language and more Freudian one, closer to a libido, to a, a, a charge of energy. Huh? And when he speak of the no literary uh, ideas, uh, no philosophical idea, uh, they says they are unuseful if you don't transpose them plastically. There, it's my second remarks, he, he is in fact uh, taking distance with the surrealists because the surrealists were not interested in plastic values at all. Huh? Like uh, Breton used to say, okay, maybe painting is a window open on the world, but what I'm interested in is to see what the window gave on, on you know, is the scene through the window. I'm not interested in the, the surface and the, your problem of painters and all that. I want to see something. Huh? And, and Bordeaux is this kind of strange case of somebody who have been raised, in fact, in the modernist tradition with the, a lot of admiration for Renoir, for Cézanne, for uh, Maurice Denis, if you want, and because he was a student of Maurice Denis for, for a while in 1929, 1930. And, uh, 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 and in, in a way, there's nothing more far from surrealism than this tradition. Ah. Uh, the, the surrealists used to make fun of Cézanne, for instance, and, uh, treating him as a monkey or something. Uh, uh, or they were very, very vicious about Cézanne. And, and Bordeaux made this kind of uh, uh, strange synthesis between it, it, uh, this idea of working from within, if you want, working from the unconscious on one hand, and on the other hand, of having a certain respect for this a modernistic tradition in which painting, the color, the form, the shapes, the movement, all that have to be also in the painting. Huh? So this uh, rejection of the uh, literary aspect make him different from the surrealists. 
third remark, if you have noticed, he separated uh, the creation of the painting in two steps. Drawing first, color after. Huh? He start by saying, I take my charcoal, it make a line and thing, and then I start with a color. I, if I decide to choose a green, I take a green, if it's a red, it's a red. This, of course, is a, a distinction between color and, a, and drawing come from his academic upbringing. Huh? This was, of course, in the School of Beaux-Arts uh, at the Fine Arts School. This was the way art was taught. You know, you start by drawing, 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 and then at the end, you had some colors. Huh? And I guess uh, this will be one of the problems we will have to detach from this type of tradition. And finally, the last remark, I would say one thing that Bordeaux doesn't say in this interview, it is that it seems that the way he put the sheet before beginning, uh, uh, the format, if you want, of his picture is very crucial in what will happen after. Because indeed, you, will a series, you have a series of gouache like this one with horizontal, and other will be vertical. When they are vertical, you have the impression that what he does, it's a line in the middle and going from the top to the bottom, and then it creates more or less the shape of a personage, let's say, on a background. When he uses, in the country like here, an horizontal format, the feeling you get, it is closer to a still life, in a way. Huh? And then La Machine à Coudre, I don't know if everybody has seen it, but it's there, huh? the sewing machine, no? The body is here somewhere, and then you have, I would say the needle will be here somewhere, and then you will have this little, many, of course, this is a, we were speaking of a whole singer of 1942, no? <laughs> not of the sophisticated machine of today. I see my mother still doing that, you know, with, the, with a lot of uh, energy. Tac, 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 tac. Well, know this is, uh, and in a way, if you think of it, this is the, uh, the subject matter of uh, nature mort, of still life, huh? maybe of a uh, peculiar type, but an object like this, uh, detached from a background, and uh, having more or less the shape. And that means also that the title, La Machine à Code, is given not, it's not the project of the painting. Huh? It is a, a title is given after the painting, when it's done. When, when the painting is finished, uh, the uh, painter could look at it and call it a name uh, of his choice. Uh, meaning he, he can make one interpretation of what he did after the painting, not before. Huh? Uh, the painting is done without preconceived idea, so it's not the application of a project that have been defined. It's just something that comes like this, that built itself under its very eyes, and at the end could be more or less figurative. Huh? Uh, wait, we will stop a little bit for 10 minutes, and I will try to show you uh, concretely all these two types of, uh, of uh, format have influenced the, the composition of the gouache. <laughs> 